Darulum is always a very special lecture because this is the house of knowledge. This is the Darulum. And this is the place where great people are produced. This is where minds that will shine across the world are produced. This is where people who will inspire thousands of people across the world are produced. This team right here of people that are sitting in front of me, you don't realize the potential that it holds. There are people outside these four walls that are waiting for dreams to come out of you. And the truth is that you guys are the keys to those dreams. You know, I wanted to share a reflection with you guys. There are just two, three points I want to make, and I won't stretch it too long. The first thing I want you to realize is your potential. People look at themselves and they think to themselves that the person next to me has potential, but I don't. That happens a lot. And sometimes it's the result of the idea of humbleness, where we humble ourselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us to be humble and not to be arrogant. And as a result of that humbleness, we think low of ourselves and we don't progress in life. We don't move forward. So we think the person next to us has an opportunity while we don't have opportunity. But you have to remember that each individual sitting here has opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognized. That's why he sent you here to nurture that opportunity, to build that opportunity. The greatest men in Islamic history were once upon a time nothing. You know, if you study Islamic history, men like Salahuddin Ayyubi, he was a no man person. When he was born, his father said that this child right here is a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The day Salahuddin Ayyubi was born was the day his father was kicked out of the fort that they lived in. And his father now no longer had a job, he was on the street, didn't know what to do, and this was the day the child was born. And when the baby would cry, the father would say that this child right here is a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was his mother that used to say, no, this child is a blessing from Allah. And then you fast forward a few years and you see this grand giant developing from this child who they thought was a curse. Then you have man like Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, who every young and old man knows of, you know, the Ali Muhammad al Medina, the scholar of Medina Munawwara. When he was young, his dream was to be a musician. He used to walk around Medina Munawwara with his musical instruments. His mom said, what are you doing? He said, mom, I'm gonna be on MTV. His mom said, MTV, my foot. She took the musical instrument and she snapped it on the ground. She then took him home and tied a white turban on his head and took him to a Masjid al-Nabwi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there was a great muhadith by the name of Rabi'ah there. She pointed towards Rabi'ah and said, go and sit there and learn from him matters before you learn his knowledge. And that's when Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi sat down and he started learning. So people who started, you have to understand, everyone starts from humble beginnings. And you are that humble beginning right now. You know, when I read the narration of the first revelation, you know, iconic, one that we all hear of all the time. You know, when I read the first revelation of Jibreel alayhi salam coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he's sitting in the cave. And you know, mankind in history, the creation itself has been waiting for this moment for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to be gifted the crown of prophethood. And when he's given the prophethood, Jibreel alayhi salam squeezes him three times, and each time the narration mentions that the Prophet sallallahu said, he squeezed me so tightly that I actually thought I was going to die. And the scholars, they deduce from this narration that this, the pathway to spirituality sometimes is very difficult. You guys understand that? It's difficult, it's not easy. And the Prophet sallallahu each time he was squeezed, he said, Ma'ala biqali, I'm not one who reads. And commentators, they explained the statement of his that I'm not one who reads every time Jibreel squeezed him. That statement actually meant was that I need a little bit more time to prepare myself. You know that humbleness I was talking about? Each individual possesses. The Prophet was being humble and he was saying, give me a few more days. And Jibreel alayhi salam says, there's no more days, now is the time. And he squeezes him again. And spiritually transferring a mountain of spirituality from one chest to the other. And then he releases him and says to him, iqra. <coughs> and now what's interesting about this is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I want you to focus. Okay? Whenever you read, the, I remember when we studied Bukhari, uh, Shaykh Yusuf <coughs> Talasa, may Allah prolong his life, he said something very beautiful. He said that when you read hadith, don't read it in isolation. Don't sit here in these walls and read hadith. Transport yourself back to the time of the Prophet Wasallam. Breathe the air. Feel the heat. Feel the heat. The words he said was that nabs bihadra kasira puro. That put your hand on the pulse of the Prophet. You know when you're watching a movie or you're watching a TV show, not that you guys watch them, but if you ever did in your life, you've noticed that when there's a very intense moment, your heart kind of stops. Have you guys felt that? Or when it's a very scary moment, your heart kind of stops. Your eyes aren't blinking anymore. Your mouth and jaw is hanging two inches. Many of you guys right now, I see it on your faces. <laughs> right? You know, when you're into something, you catch it. And he said that when you read the seerah, that's what should happen to you. When the Prophet's heart rate picks up, you feel it. When the Prophet's sad, you feel it. When we study the Prophet's life, one of the biggest mistakes we forget 
one of the biggest mistakes we make is we read the text, we read his life, the information, but we completely miss the emotion. And someone who can read the Prophet's emotion when they're reading the Prophet's life, those people are true winners. So here the Prophet ﷺ received, received the first revelation, how would I feel? I've just been told you have to take Islam all the way to Buri. It's got to come to Ramswadam. How does that happen? I'm in Arabia. He comes home, it's just him and his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. She's there, he's here. He's thinking, what happens now? She's thinking, what happens now? What do we do? But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he starts small, and he works his way, you know, chips away one bit at a time, one piece at a time, one piece at a time. And I want you to fast forward 63 years, okay? 63 years of age of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 23 years. In 23 years of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life, he's looking back now, and where he started with one lady, now he has 120,000 companions. How does a person do that? They didn't have flyers where they were just passing out after Friday prayer. Hey guys. We got an event, show up there. Or there wasn't a Facebook group, guys, like my page, make sure you follow us on YouTube, and make sure you, you retweet me. None of that business. There was no social media. There was no a mass um, a marketing available to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did he do that? And what you learn from this is two things. First of all, it was his reliance on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Secondly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had amazing character. As a person, he was beautiful. And these are two things you have to develop in yourself. You have to learn to rely on Allah. Sometimes you just got to close your eyes and say, Ya Allah, whatever you have in store for me, bring it on. As long as you're with me, I can deal with it. You have to have that reliance. And you have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, nothing's coming out of this group. And a century later, or half a century later, when you guys are the old imams, the community, rather than being guided, are going to be misguided. May Allah protect, inshallah. Right? So first of all, learn to build reliance on Allah. The second thing, develop in yourself good character. Be good people. I'm telling you right now, no matter how great of a scholar you become in your life, if you don't have patience, if you have arrogance, if you have anger issues, nobody in the world wants to look at your face. I'm just telling you right now what the world is waiting to tell the scholars across the world. People don't want to talk to people who have arrogance. If you're one of those people who has arrogant issues or, you know, pride issues, you need to deal with it right now. You need to let it out and change yourself as a person. You should think of yourself, as our teachers tell us, as the lowest of Allah's creation. That you're lucky and honored that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even gave you iman. Because trust me, as an imam in Chicago, I deal with these cases all the time. There was a girl from my community. Um, her father contacted his father. Her father was one of my closest buddies. He called me and he was crying on the phone. I said, what's up? He said to me that um, my daughter said she doesn't want to wear the hijab. And this is a girl who grew up in a Muslim household who was nurtured in a Muslim environment. And her parents were religious people. Her father is like, he's like my closest buddy. In Chicago and America, he's one of my closest friends. So I said to him, you know what, okay, let her stop wearing the hijab, she'll get around. Give her a little space, give her a little breathing space, she'll come around. Two days later, she comes home and tells her dad that I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. And this father's shocked. You know, what does he do? He calls me, he says, what do I do? I said, you can't force it on her. You know, make dua for her, give her some advice, and make dua that Allah gives her hidayah. And as a father, you know, I have three sons. If any of my children ever came and told me that they weren't confident in their iman, or their iman was shaky, that would be the end of my existence. Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he's dying, the last advice he gives to his children is, لا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون Don't die without faith. Make sure you are submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two days later, the father calls me again. He's crying. I said, what happened? He said, my daughter just slit her wrists and we're taking her to the ER right now. I don't know if my daughter's going to live. So this is what happens to people. The fact that we are sitting here and you're Muslim, you're breathing, you know, you have these great people around you, you guys can laugh and joke at each other all you want to, but the truth is that this is the A team. This is the Darul Mbari team right here. And you guys are not a part of a clique where it's only restricted to this Badrsa, it's all the ulama in the world, we're all a team. The point that I want to make with you is, first of all, rely on Allah. The second thing, make sure you develop good character. Once you have these two things, watch what happens. My teacher, Sheikh Bilal, may Allah prolong his life, Muhammad Bilal Baba, who teaches Nasai, I remember in one of his lectures, he said something phenomenal. He said that the Prophet ﷺ, during the first revelation is a student, and who's the teacher there? Jibreel. Jibreel is a teacher, and the Prophet is a student. Fast forward 23 years, 50 days before the Prophet ﷺ passes away is when Hadith Jibreel occurs. Hadith Jibreel is a phenomenal event that occurs during the Prophet's life. It's 50 years before, 50 days before. It's after Hajjat al-Wada, the Prophet ﷺ lived approximately 90 days after Hajjat al-Wada. Hajj takes place on the 9th or 10th of the Hijjah. And he passed away 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, which gives you roughly 90 days. 
So within the last 50 days of the Prophet's life, this incident of hadith Jibreel occurs. And this anonymous man walks in, he sits in front of the Prophet, very unique in his form, very composed in his speech, very confident in his answers. And after he has this conversation with the Prophet ﷺ, he gets up and leaves. And the Prophet ﷺ asks the narrator, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, do you know who that man was? And Umar radiallahu anh says, Allahu wa rasuluhu alam, I have no idea, only Allah and the Rasul know. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ja'akum Jibreel yu'allimukum dinakum. That was Jibreel who just came to teach you your faith. So, Muhammad ibn Allah, my teacher, he used to say, 23 years ago, the teacher was Jibreel and the student was the Prophet. And 23 years fast forward now, the teacher is the Prophet and the student is Jibreel. And that's the potential a student has. <coughs> he can even surpass his own teacher. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes that point by proving that even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam surpassed Jibreel alayhi wa So those were the first two points. First thing, understand your potential. Second thing, um, develop good character in yourselves. Be good people. And the third thing I want to say to you, the last thing I want to share with you guys, is that this is an Anjuman gathering, right? This is where you guys practice your lectures, your speeches. You have to come out and try here. You can't be lazy. You can't be a coward. If you're a coward, you know, on the soccer field, it doesn't matter. If you're a coward in lifting or, or, or anything else in your life, it really doesn't matter. But this is a place where you can't be a coward. You know why you can't be a coward here? It's because this is your opportunity to serve the deen. You know, people talk about this, right? I want to die for Islam. I want to die for Islam. We don't need people dying for Islam. We need them to live for Islam. And we need you guys to live for Islam. We need you guys to step out of your shyness and break it and say, you know what? I'm here, I'm going to work hard, and this is where I'm going to develop myself. I'm going to share with you guys my experience of the Anjuman. I still remember I was in his class in Darul Buffalo, which is a madrasa, which is an offshoot from Bury itself. The teachers were all graduates from here. And the first time I, was ever, I ever gave a lecture in Anjuman, I was maybe 10 years old. It was a big competition. You guys still have the competitions here? No, no more? They're over? So they used to have an uh, Anjuman competition in, in Buffalo. So all the Anjuman, you guys have Anjuman groups, right? Like different groups? So all the groups compete. So they choose one person from each group to come and represent the group. In my group, all the guys were jokers, and other guys wanted to do, do the lecture. So they said to me, Hussein, give the lecture. I was a 10-year-old kid. I was like, guys, I'm not doing it. There are kids here who are in Bukhari, Mishkat, Hidayah. I'm not doing it. They said to me that we'll give you 10 sneaker bars and two cases of pop. Pop is Coca-Cola. So I said, OK, I'm ready. <laughs> It's the first lecture I gave in my life. So I said, okay, what am I going to talk about? So one of the guys said, you know what? I'll give you the topic. Another guy said, I'll write the lecture for you. All you have to do is get up and read it. I said, God, I just got to get up and read? Ten sneaker bars and two cases of pop? I'm in. Okay? I didn't know what was going to hit me. So I remember the day came. I um, had this paper. I got up in front of the crowd. The guy in front of me was a Bukhari student, by the way. He, I was competing against a Bukhari student. Okay? Ten-year-old kid. I haven't even memorized seven jews by now. So this Bukhari guy gets up there and he gives this bling lecture. He smashes it, okay? My turn comes, I get up, and I'm like, pull out my paper, and all of a sudden I notice my hands were shaking. I'm like, what is going on? My feet were shaking. I'm like, what's going on here? And then I forgot to notice that everyone was listening to me through the mic, but my paper was so close to my nose that no one could see me, and my voice wasn't even going in the mic. And I'm reading the paper, and I was a complete imbecile. I made a moron out of myself, okay? I gave this lecture. After I was done, everyone started laughing at me. I'm telling you. I wrapped up the paper. I sat down, and I broke out into tears. I thought to myself, oh, my God, I just made a fool out of myself for 10 snicker bars. So I went back to my room. My older brother, Sheikh Mubin, more Allah prolong his life, he came to me, and he put his hand on my shoulder and said to me, Hussein, we're going to work on this, and we're going to make this right. Then I came to Bury, Arden Bury here, and this is when I, uh, by then I had finished off my head, I started studying the Alam course, and like any kid, I was dodging my way out of the Anjuman, you know, making up some random excuse every time. I'd go to Qaisa's office and say I had to go somewhere, or say my leg was hurting, make some random excuse. I fell in the wudu area, or I spilled some water on myself, you know, something dumb every time. I made my way through for the greater part, and finally what happened was that there was one student, may Allah prolong his life, Sheikh Nisad, he lives in Bolton. He said something to me that was so powerful, it was life-changing, right? And this is to the older students that are here, the Bukhari students, you have, you have ability to inspire the younger students that even you are unaware of. You are mentors for them. He came to me, and I remember it was maybe in this area right here, in this area of the Jamaat Khana. He came to me and said to me, Hussein, I've been watching over the Anjuman roster, and I noticed that you haven't given a lecture in a while. So I said, you know, Nisar, I'm you know, a little 
busy, I got other things going on in my life, and then Qadr Allah wa ma fa'al, taqdeer is also against me. He said, cut it. And you know what he said to me after that? He said something interesting. He said to me, I'm from Bolton, because that guy was from Bolton. He said, you know, in my community we have 400 alims. When I graduate, I'm going to go back to my community, I'm not going to do much. I'm going to go teach maktab in some small masjid, I'm going to do something that's probably not going to be significant. You're from America. And when you graduate, your country is waiting for you. So you can't make excuses, you need to get up and do something. So I said, okay, you know what, I'm going to do it. And that was the first time I wrote a lecture. I remember this very clearly. And um, this is what the advice I'm going to give you guys now. So when you're developing yourselves in your anjuman, one advice I would give you is find a simple structure to building a lecture. And the simplest structure of building a lecture is quote an ayah of the Qur'an, quote a narration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, give an example to explain it, quote a second narration, give an example to explain it, quote a third narration, give an example to explain it, and close off everything with a summary. You guys understand that? It's the best thing as a beginner to make it very clear at the beginning of the lecture, like I did to you guys right now. I told you guys, if you guys noticed, I said to you, I'm going to discuss three points. And through the, through the lecture, I guided you. That was point number one. That was point number two. This is point number three. And before I end the lecture, you're going to notice that I will summarize everything again. So that way, those that are following, they can be engaged and they know where it started and they also know where it's ending. Build a structure. The second thing I want you to know, there are two things that you have to understand about giving a lecture. The first is the delivery. The second is the content. Are you guys following here? No? Okay. What was the first thing? Delivery. Delivery. The second thing is the content. content. Okay. The content, don't worry about it. Trust me on this, the anjuman is not for content. What did I say to you guys? It's not for content. The main thing that you can benefit from anjuman is your delivery. And the best way to do that is to write a lecture, literally, word by word if you need to do it or whatever it is, memorize it, deliver it once, twice, you know how many times I delivered one of the first lectures I gave in my life? I delivered it 21 times. How many times? I delivered the same exact lecture 21 times. And I went to a new crowd, and I would go to Jumma Khutbah, and I would do the Khutbah, I would do it again. Every time I was doing it, I had already mastered the content, so the content wasn't my concern. Now it was all about the style. Where did I want to raise my voice? Where did I want to drop it? Where was I going to engage with my hands? and how I was going to keep looking around the crowd. I'm constantly looking at who's paying attention, who isn't paying attention. This man over here is laughing. So, you know, constantly you're looking around and you're paying attention to, hey, this is what's happening, that's what's happening. And it's all about learning and engaging with people. And the more you can engage, the more energy you give them, they give you back in return. The idea here is, my friends, that master your delivery. Master. Again, I remember I asked Hazrat once, I said to him that I have a lecture, the first public speech I ever gave in my life, was in Scotland with my teacher, Sheikh Bilal. Mawlana Bilal Sahib told me that we're going to Scotland and the people there speak English, so you're going to be giving a lecture there. So I kind of freaked out. I was like, oh my God, I'm giving a lecture, first public speech outside the masjid, outside this place, and, um, and my teacher is going to be there. So I was driving um, Hazrat around. I used to have a little micra, and I, I don't even know how I sat in that car, but you know, I used to drive him around when I was in Madrasa. By then, Hazrat, Hazrat had a shoulder, so, shoulder surgery, and I can tell you stories, man. Oh my goodness. Some of the best moments in my life were driving Hazrat around. Especially when someone would cut me off, I'd go after the Hazrat and say, Ruk <laughs> Slow down. And I'd be like, oh my god, that guy just got away. Anyway, I don't share too much, too much stuff with you guys, or kids here too. <laughs> Some things are not appropriate, you know. Um, and I asked Hazrat, I said to Hazrat, Hazrat, I got a lecture coming up in Scotland, what do I do? So Hazrat said, think of a lecture you gave in your life. I said, okay, I got it. He said to me, now what you're going to do is, I want you to drive one day, park your car on the side of the road, <coughs> and do the whole lecture to yourself. And he said, I want you to do this for every day until you give that lecture. Two months. I read that lecture to myself for how many months? <laughs> Two months every day I read that lecture to myself. And it was this exercise of doing one lecture again and again and again and again, which taught me how to deliver. <coughs> Once you figure out the delivery, the content will come by itself. You guys are great scholars, I'm sure, and you are masters in your sciences and the leaders of the future, inshallah. So don't worry about the content. Right now, focus on your delivery, and that will help you out a lot. So anyway, guys, to summarize things, um, I discussed three main points. The first thing I said to you guys was search for your potential. Never lose hope. Rely on Allah, 
develop good character. Two things. Rely on Allah, <laughs> develop good character. And the third thing, when you're here, especially those of you guys who are giving the lectures in the Anjuman, don't cop out. Don't like split when the time comes for you to give a lecture. Stand up, be confident. If you make a mistake, it's cool. Because the people in this, this, this room right here, trust me, after you graduate, you're not going to see half their faces again. Especially if you're from America, you're never going to see them again. Right? They're too cheap to come to you, you're too cheap to go to them. So you're going to be splitting ways. But while you're here, let it be laughs, let it be jokes, but trust me, it'll help you in the long run. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us all. Mm -hmm. I pray for you guys. You guys, please pray for me as well. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as we're gathered here today, <coughs> He gathered us all together in Jannah to free those. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad.